this is a, um, a very interesting opportunity to say something about the exhibit. Um, I, what I want to do in uh, just half an hour, if possible, is to create a context for you for the exhibit. Um, it's difficult to know when people come to an exhibit like this, what they have in their minds about Afghanistan to begin with. Um, and I think that Afghanistan wasn't very important to most people in America until the, uh, maybe the time of the Taliban in the mid-90s, and even more so, of course, after 9-11. Um, I grew up in England and uh, remember from uh, a much earlier time uh, reading the lines in Kipling, um, when you're lying out there on Afghanistan's plains and the women come out to strew your remains, roll to your rifles and blow out your brains and go to the war like a soldier. And that's the reputation that Afghanistan had in uh, uh, at least that part of the English-speaking world um, at the end of the colonial period because there had been three Anglo-Afghan wars and in the first two, the English had lost a whole army third one, they just um, thought, thought it uh, a close before they lost too much. Um, but now, um, Afghanistan has a very different <coughs> reputation, but uh, maybe not a more positive one. So um, I'm going to take you through, um, let me see, uh, uh, a number of subjects. So I want to first um, uh, um, go through what I think you need to know about Afghanistan in order to appreciate the exhibit, and then uh, what you need to know about carpets in order to think about what you're looking at, and then uh, finish up by saying what I think is special about Warhub, because I think that uh, the uh, creation of this exhibit is very important for a number of points of view, which is what gave me the idea of the title, that is, it's telling us something about what's going on in the world in general at this moment, not just about Afghanistan. Um, so, uh, you might be, think this is, that this is a, uh, uh, not the right way to ask the question, but um, I've come across so many people who don't live in where Afghanistan is, and certainly um, don't know very much about it, um, or its relationship with the surrounding area. And um, if you think about it, Afghanistan is in the middle of Asia. You would, it's rather surprising, isn't it, that a place that's in the middle of the largest landmass in the world should be so little known. Um, I think that in order to um, uh, bring this home for you, I need to show you a map, and I hope that I can do this easily. chose this um, way to show you a map because um, it, it gives you a good idea of the, of the um, topography, which is so much a part of the story. Um, you can probably, s well, actually the country, the mountains and desert mean that it's not so clear as it might be, but um, Afghanistan, you can see anyway, is in, is in the middle of Asia 
and there are um, center of Afghanistan, there is a concerned about the Russians who were expanding through Central Asia, and especially since they'd heard about the relationship between uh, the Russians and Napoleon. Uh, and this was the only boundary that they couldn't easily protect. This boundary was protected by the Himalayas, the sea was protected by the Royal Navy, but this was open. And so they wanted to make sure much of Central Asia, most of Pakistan, and also Kashmir. Um, however, very soon after the British arrived there, for reasons that, that um, I'm sorry to disappoint you, have nothing to do with the British, uh, the uh, Afghanistan began to fall apart because of inter-dynastic uh, rivalry. Um, and with it, by the middle of the 19th century, there would have been no Afghanistan. Russians were uh, moving down Central Asia towards where this border is now, and the British were trying to make sure they had something here that they could defend. Uh, and they agreed finally on a piece of territory like this, shaped rather like a bit of land, um, with the Hindu Kush in the middle, and Turk Turkish or Turkic plains, plains settled plains and deserts settled mainly by Pashtuns or Pathan people to the south. Uh, and then in 1880, they found an heir to the previous dynasty, who was in exile in Central Asia, the Shirdi family, uh, and in order to make sure that there was a, somebody on the throne in Afghanistan who would seem to have legitimacy to the people there, they put him on the throne and gave him a subsidy. So, for this reason, um, what emerged out of the 19th century was a, a, a large piece of country with a population of, at that time, about 10 million, which had been completely isolated from the rest of the world 
by the Russians in the north and the British in the south, um, cut off from what was changing in the rest of the world. There were the word Afghans who came out and went to India. Uh, that was the main route out of Afghanistan, but they didn't. There weren't very many, and Afghanistan remained more or less as it was, with very little social change, social responsibility from the 19th century through into the early 20th century. There was an effort after the First World War to open it up, but by that time, um, there was so, so much resistance to fast change that it failed. And change uh, began to develop very slowly from 1920 onwards, but it was really slow until the middle of the last century, the middle of the 20th century, when modern events began to develop, which you're probably familiar with, and we'll talk about a little bit more later on. So, what I want to point I want to make to this map is that Afghanistan was left out of what was going on in the rest of the world at a crucial time of the emergence of the modern world from uh, the, in the 19th century and through into the middle of the 20th. Um, let me see if I can go back. Uh, uh, maybe if you, if you can give us 15 minutes we might have time. So um, that's my answer to the to the first question. Um, that Afghanistan is in the middle of things uh, in its science civilization, but because of the way the British and the Russian empires um, moved in the 19th century, it was cut off from science civilization and ceased to be a center of anything, uh, but became uh, I suppose something like a hole in the middle of a donut. Um, and um, finished up being completely isolated and changed. Uh, so the next thing is, um, well actually maybe there's one other thing I should say about here, uh, cities and tribes. Um, the um, Afghanistan as it was in the center of the Islamic world before the colonial period um, has been called, um, the Islamic civilization has been called a city civilization. That's inventing a term in order to avoid using the word civilized, which ha obviously has um, value connotations. But Islamic civilization is a civilization based on cities, which is not really the case of Western civilization when it's um, what's grown out of uh, medieval feudalism. Um, so there are some very famous cities of the Islamic period of Islamic civilization before the colonial period in and around Afghanistan. Um, those cities during the colonial period were cut off from the rest of, of um, the Islamic world. And therefore, since their um, position was based largely on trade, they declined seriously. And what took their place was that the people who lived outside the cities, who were tribally organized, nomadic, like the Bedouin of the Middle East, um, began to be the most important part of the population. And it was that uh, sector of the population that became dominant after the colonial period. So that Afghan society, uh, in, in, its, um, in the way that it was prepared to relate to the rest of the world, was completely different in the second half of the 20th century from what it had been in the first half of the 19th century. Um, it's a very interesting geopolitical um, case study, of, and it's difficult to find anything quite the same as that in the rest of the world. Um, so that, that's, let me change the subject uh, and start talking about carpets. Um, we talk about carpets and rugs, uh, and they're really the same thing. Uh, carpets goes back to a Latin root, and rugs goes back to an Anglo-Saxon root. Um, rug and rag actually are the same word originally. Um, so don't be confused by the, the fact that I, I probably forget which one I'm using. Um, uh, it's true that carpets tend to have been used as, uh, uh, because of our, the, the habits, linguistic habits we have with 
words have come from Latin uh, to be part of tend to be used for the more impressive variety and rugs for the smaller, less interesting ones, but there really was no distinction. Um, carpets really, as we know them, come from this part of the world. And the oldest um, examples that we know about come from um, not much less than 2,500 years ago. And they were already quite sophisticated, so they probably have a longer history than that. Um, and they were produced not by uh, ordinary people in villages, but in cities, in workshops and uh, factories. And so the, the carpets that you can see in the collection of the Philadelphia Museum of Art, for example, um, don't come from the same type of weavers as you see uh, in, as, as the products you see in this exhibit. Um, they, the ones in the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the, the, the main large collector's items, were made for royal courts and for uh, the elite of the uh, main uh, Islamic um, communities of Western Asia and the Mediterranean. Uh, they probably, they still probably began in Central Asia, but spread throughout the Islamic world to the west and to the east, so that we now have carpets from all parts of Central Asia and China, as well as from all parts of Western Asia, Turkey, and, uh, and other countries in the Mediterranean. Um, the, uh, these um, impressive urban products began to appear in the Western market um, sometime in the middle of our medieval period, uh, because they appear in Renaissance paintings. At that time, they weren't used as floor coverings. They were too highly prized. And uh, in, in obviously, in, in the Middle East and where they came from, they were used to sit on on the floor. But in Western world, people didn't sit on the floor. And so they were used as table coverings. And that's the way you see them in medieval paintings. Um, but um, uh, we didn't come to know about other types of carpet woven by people in villages until much later. And by that time, um, the number of the, the interest in carpets had increased in the West as a result of the increasing affluence with the Industrial Revolution and even the period leading up to that. Uh, and uh, factories had developed in the Western world um, that set out to reproduce the equivalent of Oriental carpets in the Western world. And as you will probably recognize, some of the um, proprietary names of early factory-made carpets in the West. So this led to uh, a new attitude towards carpets generally in the Western world. A lot of people who could afford them wanted authentic Oriental carpets, which was the age of Orientalism in the old sense of the word. Before Abel Said wrote a big book on Orientalism and succeeded in changing the meaning of the word overnight in 1980, or 1978 maybe. Um, so uh, all the time, the Outside the urban workshops, carpets were produced for local use, not for trade. But when the um, economic situation of the people in these areas began to decline, um, uh, later in the, in the 19th century and into the 20th century, they began to sell their carpets, and they had a lot of old carpets to sell. And it was these carpets that became collector's items. So uh, if we um, go to um, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, for example, and look at some of their tribal carpets, their Turkmen carpets, these are carpets that, that um, are not as old as the urban products, uh, are exquisite in their, uh, the, the fineness of their weave. Um, 
but they're not, uh, um, they're not, well, they're not so old, but they're not modern either. However, copies of excellent quality were made by the Britons um, well into the 20th century, in fact, until very recently. Um, there are also carpets made in rural areas that are not so distinguished, um, and the, the best known um, are um, associated with tribes um, called Baruch, um, who uh, some of whom live among the Turkmen tribes in the northern part of Afghanistan and in Central Asia. And these um, tend to have more figurative designs on them. Uh, the Turkmen carpets tended to be mainly geometrical, uh, floral and geometric designs, and the Baruch carpets tend to be more figurative with um, um, representations of farmyard um, scenes and um, donkeys and um, agriculture and so on. So there was, uh, from early on, among some people, a, a, an interest in representing in carpet design um, the, uh, what they saw in their daily life. Um, Though most of what we think of as oriental carpets are not that at all. They're exquisite gardens and Saturday carpets, um, or they are purely geometrical and floral designs. Um, the, it, it's only relatively late in um, the collecting, the history of the collecting of carpets in, this, in the West, that people have got interested in wanted to give us a present um, uh, before they left, and um, they thought that what we would obviously like would be a design or a portrait of President Nixon. Um, and we um, politely declined um, and tried to think of some other um, compromise that we could come up with, and we eventually settled on a, a, the logo of the Penn Museum. So there was an interest as early as that in the idea of um, designing something for a special purpose and for a direct market possibility. We didn't buy it, but it, it, they were, the weavers were designing something directly for the consumer. Everything that we knew of up until that point uh, was not uh, the result of a direct relationship between the weaver, producer, and consumer. It was they were that were produced in Western or Central Asia uh, for the local uh, for local use, and they had been um, picked up by weavers, and the number of weavers and the network of weavers had been expanding for uh, gradually at first and then faster over several centuries, uh, linking up with dealers in Europe, with mainly between Istanbul and beginning with Venice, and then between Istanbul. And market, um, but again, no direct relationship between the producer and the consumer, and what the consumer, the producer got for their work was a very small portion of the cost that the consumer actually uh, laid out to buy the product. Um, but by the middle of the 20th century, um, tourism had grown to the point where it was al already the idea that possibly the weaver might produce directly for the consumer. And um, this uh, um, process accelerated to a, a, a much faster, <coughs> a much faster pace with the appearance of Soviet soldiers in Afghanistan in 1980. Uh,
sell something for, for more money. I want, before I pass over this slide, I wanted to say something about um, the role of collecting and connoisseurship and the search for authenticity, because this has played a big part in the, in the um, history of the Oriental writing artist. Um, uh, collecting, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, began to become a much more serious activity in the Western world in the late 19th century. And um, that's why museums like this got founded in the 1880s um, uh, and were funded for a long time, um, unfortunately not so much anymore, by uh, people who wanted to spend a lot of money to bring um, artifacts, interesting artifacts and other parts of the world to this country. And this led to the development of connoisseurship, and connoisseurship is always the art of, of um, showing why something you like is different from what everybody else likes. <laughs> and, um, uh, and the best way to uh, prove that what you like is better is to show that it's more authentic. So there began to be a, a, an increasing insistence on uh, finding the authentic authentic example of traditional um, uh, Central Asian pottery we have its best. And this uh, be be uh, was an engine in the market that drove the market because it provided a leadership of the market by connoisseurs um, paying high prices for the best carpet and then um, the rest of the market following that um, interest. So let's move on to uh, war robes. Um, what happened in the 1980s after the uh, communist um, change of government in 1978 um, was the beginning of a, of a period of civil war which tore the social fabric of Afghanistan apart. Um, I don't want to, I have to be careful not to go into too much detail Describing this, it, it, uh, since I'm an anthropologist, it's the, the part of the story that really interests me most. Um, uh, we don't, most of us, I think, realize that we have, we're told so often about how fragile the natural environment is, and most of us don't realize the history of a major society in our indi individualistic cultural mode. We don't realize how fragile the social environment countries like Afghanistan were torn apart by um, internal and domestic strife, starting very soon after the, the uh, change of government in 1978, and um, uh, it's clearly um, recovered, obviously, now. Um, and what disruption does is it accelerates the rate of change. So um, Afghanistan, having been isolated during the earlier period between the sandwich between the Russian and the British empires, um, suddenly found itself open up, opened up to change influ uh, influences from the, the rest of the world in the middle of the last century and began to change at an accelerating rate and it was this, this acceleration of the rate of change that brought on the change of government in 1978 because people of, of one, in one sector of the society were impatient royal government was um, managing, um, actually was managing quite well up until that point. Um, and so, um, uh, while many people actually left the country, became refugees, and uh, uh, set up residence in refugee camps, mainly in Pakistan, but also to, uh, to a large extent in Iran, um, they had to uh, make use of any skills they had customers for anything they could produce. And so they started trying to develop carpets, rugs, for um, uh, direct marketing to foreigners in Afghanistan in a way that um, had never happened before. Um, 
so the earliest war routes that we have examples of, uh, that we know about, um, come from the early 1980s. And to begin with, um, the production of steam cooling plants, um, um, a small amount of the cobalt production. So it's very difficult for us to tell because obviously we've not been able to do research on the ground to find out any facts about it. Um, we, judging by what we've been able to find out, Also, qualities have uh, proliferated uh, and the designs have proliferated. Now, if you walk around this exhibit, you will see uh, quite a significant range of different qualities from uh, superb, um, relatively large rugs, um, which, if you look at from a distance, um, uh, look as though they're perhaps traditional turning on get up close to them, you'd see that the design breaks down into um, modern items of war rather than geometrical and floral designs. But it's not obvious from a distance. Other carpets um, are quite obvious to whether you're looking at them from a distance or not. Um, uh, figurative, um, showing you directly helicopter gunships and um, AK-47 uh, there's also a range of quality from carpets that are several hundred um, knots per square inch and some which are um, that vary a hundred or we're talking about much more than a hundred square knots per square inch. Um, the carpet is a, a very interesting textile that, that's made with um, uh, three different types of wool which are produced by Three, by spinning wool into three different qualities of thread. And the warp threads are um, so um, strong that use the, uh, the spun from the longest hairs of the wool um, that they're as strong as cotton. And the weft threads are uh, uh, shorter threads and the uh, spun from shorter threads and the um, tile, which is made with knots, It's all wool, and uh, if you find any cotton or um, silk in the exhibit, uh, then that is the, the silk or the cotton is usually used in good rugs uh, in order to represent a color which is less easy to make than wool, uh, a white, for example. Um, however, uh, uh, less good rugs might use cotton. Um, so, this, what happened in the 1980s was that people began to adapt old skills, uh, which had been very important as a side um, occupation for generations, into a major occupation for the new situation. And they were doing this because they discovered Um, as you look through these, I've, I've, I've already gone over my half hour, so I'm, I'm trying to pull things together quickly so that we can uh, perhaps have a chance for some questions uh, before you go to look at the exhibit. Um, and these are the, the questions that I suggest you bear in mind. Um, what is the artistic value of these carpets? Um, that is, sociological point of view, from an ethnographic point of view, um, they are indicators of, of um, what's going on, what's changing in the society. But actually, what is actually the artistic value of them? Are they protest art? Which, of course, um, many Westerners jump to the conclusion that that's what they are. They're protest art. They're, they're produced by people who are protesting against the situation. I don't think so. But you sh this is the sort of thing that one has to have a hypothesis <coughs> and try to work out what one can, uh, what data one can come up with to test the hypothesis. And since we can't go and interview people who are weaving the rugs, we can never know. Um, 
um, I think that they're tourist art, actually, but they're tourist art of a much more interesting type than what one might, uh, uh, than, for example, the Silkstone Harbor you might buy in Fairbanks Airport, um, produced by um, local um, indigenous people there. Um, but the most interesting question is, what can we learn from this um, phenomenon? And uh, I, my main interest since the Middle East and West Central Asia began to change at a much faster rate, starting about a generation ago. And I realized that everything that I had um, done in the study of this part of the world up until that point <coughs> didn't work anymore because everything had changed and the methods I used didn't apply to the new situation. I began to get interested in the process of globalization and trying to make sense of that. And this seems to me to be uh, a, an unusually good and interesting example of what globalization is doing to a part of the world which was opened up to it probably late <coughs> had an unusual history and had uh, specific cultural traditions um, that are now opened up to a, a completely different audience as well as market. And uh, what we're seeing is the reaction to that. And what is interesting to think about now is what is going to lead to it, not only in Afghan art, but also in act Afghan culture and um, uh, the Afghan economy in the coming generation. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Uh, we'll take some questions as you suggested, but just to start them off. Is this the only part? Of, is this the only region of, uh, of, of that part of the world that makes war rugs? Are there other Similar rugs being made? The, um, since the late medieval period, there have been rugs made uh, that have derived from this tradition as far east as China and as far west as Morocco. That is, it's spread throughout the, um, the Islamic world. Um, and the reason it spread so far was largely the um, heritage of the Mongol Empire in the 13th and 14th centuries is what, what led it to spread in, in Central Asia in both directions. It's not with that kind of iconography? No, the iconography changes. Mm. And so that if you go to a, a good dealer now, um, they should be able to show you um, uh, carpets that are recognizable as to their origin um, from different parts Central Asia, East Central Asia, uh, further east in um, northwestern China, and also um, um, the Caucasus, um, what is now Turkey, and Egypt and North Africa. <coughs> so that, and you can, rec uh, one can recognize these. Yeah. Thank you. I wondered if, if we're missing something in the The tradition, as far as the tribal carpets are concerned, I mean, the, the, forget the carpets in the Philadelphia Museum of Art, right? The, the tribal carpets, the Turkmen carpets, and the Baruch carpets, um, from which the war rugs that you will see are derived, um, are the essential furnishing for the people that make them. And because they're the essential furnishing, they're the essential piece of any dowry. And Many of the best um, rugs were woven into the parts of the dowry. But um, there is also, uh, and I'm not sure how far back this began, and I don't think that it's very old, uh, the idea of weaving rugs 
especially for um, prayer. Um, and, but I've never seen them there, and they are woven in Afghanistan now, but I think that that um, style of rug began uh, in Turkey and then spread from there. Um, so I think those are the two main things. Yeah? I was just wondering, uh, given the sort of Wahhabi influence in Afghanistan and the attitudes under them against figurative art, how did that relate to the making of this rug? <laughs> That's an interesting question that I hadn't thought of. Um, I've never seen anything written about it, uh, or uh, I don't know that anybody's picked up on it. Um, uh, the, the question is, because the uh, Islamist activity promoted by um, Wahhabi-oriented Muslims from Saudi Arabia uh, in this part of the world since the 1980s, which we helped through the CIA uh, support the Mujahideen in Afghanistan in the 1980s. Uh, these people um, uh, that we tend to refer to as Islamists who uh, want to um, 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 <coughs> regularize the, uh, Islam throughout the Islamic world, return it to its original uh, form, time of the prophet, uh, these people tend to want to get rid of any figurative art, which is the reason why calligraphy is such an important art form in the Islamic world. And the question was whether this, um, is, uh, do this one would think would be in conflict with the idea of producing rugs with figurative designs on them. And I have to admit that it's something I've never thought of, and I've never seen any objections to figurative art in carpet. shows that the weavers who have been dislocated from their traditional situation and are looking for new ways to survive. And uh, weaving is one of the things that they can do, perhaps the only thing they can do besides agriculture, uh, are looking for um, people who might buy what they could produce and trying to work out what designs would appeal to them. And the first people who came along were Soviet uh, soldiers and then American GIs, yeah. but it could lead to anything. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, I, I would guess that if one were to uh, wander about in the local markets in Pakistan and other areas now, one would find a variety of new designs. But I haven't been able to do that recently. Yes? If, if I were to walk in Connoisseurs were horrified by this development um, <coughs> of war rugs. Um, and um, it's been very frustrating trying to learn more about them because we can't track down the, as in the past, you couldn't find, you couldn't track a carpet from the place where you bought it here to where it was produced. You had to work that out from circumstantial evidence that allowed you eventually to classify carpets according to the design and their workmanship. Um, these carpets, we have no idea where most of them are made. Um, um, and so you might say, well, wh why am I saying then that, that they're wo woven directly for the consumer? Well, we don't know who the original consumer was in most cases because people 
bought them on the spot and then sold them, sold them again. And the ones that you're going to see in the gallery upstairs, I understand, were bought on eBay. Uh, and I think that's in the documentation <laughs> you were given. Um, so, um, uh, the, the, the thing is that the, um, the globalization of the market has taken the market out of the hands of the connoisseur. And, and so authenticity isn't what it used to be. some good leaders in the 20th century as well. Uh, but I, would, I wonder what percentage of Afghans who are alive today were born before 1978. Not a very large percentage, I imagine. Uh, but I, um, I'm in full sympathy with your, your point of view.
shows the, the unity of the um, cultural environment of yes. Pakistan and Afghanistan. If we go back, we might see some of that if we talk about the film, which is actually um, offensive, but uh, done by the honesty of Saddam Hussein, much like our attack on Russia. One last question. If, uh, if these rods that we're seeing upstairs were acquired on eBay, how, how does one judge their authenticity? How do you know they're not being woven in Chicago? <laughs> <laughs> we have uh, um, publications um, and uh, a lot of history that, of, of what's been done with these war rugs in the, in the last, uh, starting in the mid 90s, um, which I think actually do come from Afghanistan. So even though we can't say where they came from exactly, we know where in the general region that they came and, from. And I have, I, have, I also have, um, I have my own personal contacts in the Afghan rug market, and I have been uh, talking to people there. So I, I appreciate your doubts, <laughs> but I'm fairly confident myself that that's where they come from. Well, Brian, thank you very much.